What is up everybody? So I got a really quick video for you today because this isn't as complicated of a topic as some of the other ones that we cover on this channel and also just to convince myself that I can still make a sub 10 minute video. So the topic of today is called interrupted time series and it's by far one of my favorite topics in data science. And the reason is because it's one of those topics that bridges the gap between all the stuff you learn in your academic career when you're studying data science and what you actually use in the real world as a data scientist. So let's dive into it with an example as we always do. Let's say that you run a successful ice cream shop in town and you want your ice cream shop to be even more successful as measured by the number of ice cream cones that you're able to sell every single day. So we have this plot, which basically on the x-axis is which day it is, so some measure of time. And on the y-axis, we have the number of ice cream cones that we sold that day. Now, what you want to do in order to boost the number of ice cream cones that you sell is do a little bit of advertising. So you're gonna post up flyers for your ice cream shop at the local library. You're hoping that people will see the flyers, that'll cause them to come in and you'll sell more cones every single day. Now, in an ideal world, if you want to exactly measure the effect of such an experiment, you would run what's called an A-B test. But it, there's a lot of complications to doing an A-B test in the real world like this. If you really wanted to do this right, you would need to open a second ice cream shop pretty much right next to yours with the same name, with the same sales record, with the same brand perception, same everything. And then you put up flyers for one of those shops at the local library and you see what happens. So the one that didn't get the advertising maybe sold 20 ice cream cones a day. And the one that did get the advertising sells maybe 100 ice cream cones per day. And now you know, for a matter of fact, that difference, that 80 cone difference per day is a result of the advertising campaign. Now, that seems good in theory, but there's so many roadblocks to that. You're not going to open up a second shop that's so expensive and wasteful. You can't really guarantee that if somebody saw the flyer that they showed up to the right one of those shops because they're right next to each other. There's too many things that we can't control. And this is the story for a lot of things in the real world. Here there were monetary and logistical constraints, but you can think of ethical constraints as well. Let's say they work for the government health agency and you're trying to figure out the effect of smoking on long-term health. Ideally, you would get a bunch of subjects and you would have uh, assigned to each of them to smoke a different amount over the course of their lifetime, but there's a lot of ethical constraints with that. It doesn't seem like the right thing to do to just tell somebody to smoke a certain amount of cigarettes for their lifetime. So there's these ethical constraints, there's these monetary constraints, there's these logistical constraints. All that is to say that many, many times in the real world, and especially when you do actual work as a data scientist at a company, there's reasons that you can't just run a simple test to measure the effects that you're trying to measure. And that's where non-experimental techniques, such as interrupted time series, come in. This is specifically a type of non-experimental technique that you can run when the data that you're dealing with is time series data, you go ahead and just do some kind of intervention or treatment, in this case being the advertising at the library, and you just see what happened before the treatment, you see what happened after the treatment, and you fit some kind of model in order to understand the effect of your change from before to after the treatment. And so let's get into what that model actually looks like. So again, on this graph, on the x-axis, we have time. This orange line is when we went ahead and posted all of those advertising flyers at the library. On the y-axis, again, we have the number of cones we sell per day. So you can see before we do the advertising, of course, there's a lot of variability, but generally it's increasing at this rate with this green linear curve here that we're going to model. And then after we do the advertising, we see that a couple of things change. The level changes, so there's this instantaneous jump from before to after the treatment. And also the slope has changed. We are increasing more and more cones a day, seemingly as a result of this treatment. And so we're gonna turn that seemingly into something concrete by fitting this very simple linear model here. So although I do say this model is simple, there is a little bit to talk about here. So this model is saying, let's model the number of ice cream cones that you're going to sell on any given day. So let me put a hat here to say this is a prediction. So we're going to call that prediction based on this first part, which should just seem like a simple linear regression on time. So beta naught plus beta one T, and that's exactly the linear model before, in the before period plus this d sub t, this d is because it's what's called a dummy variable, all that means that this variable is zero if we're talking about a time period before we did the treatment, and it's one if it's a time period after we did the treatment. And that gets multiplied by this also linear looking equation, beta two plus beta three times time, and that's going to be the change in our linear model from the before period. And so to understand what this form is actually doing, let's break it up into two cases. Let's say that we're in the period before the treatment. So that means that this dummy variable is gonna be equal to zero, which means this whole right part doesn't even matter. 
So you're just saying that, you know what, we're going to model the number of ice cream cones you sell as beta naught plus beta 1t. Makes sense, just a simple linear model, the one in the before period. Now let's say that it's the period after we did the treatment, so that this dummy variable is 1. So now the intercept and slope of our linear regression change. What's the new intercept? Well, it's going to be beta naught plus beta 2. And what's the new slope? Well, because they're both multiplied by this time, which is the independent variable we have here, the new slope is going to be beta 1 plus beta 3. And so that's why I say this second part here, this beta 2 plus beta 3t, is going to describe the change in our linear model from the before period into what the linear model now looks like in the after period. So the question we were after is, based on doing this advertising campaign or doing any intervention for any time series data that we have where we don't want to run a test or we can't run a test for logistical reasons, how can we know the effect of that change without needing to run an experiment? And so the answer, very simply, from fitting a model that looks like this, is going to be measure the significance of two parameters and see if you can figure out which two parameters there are here based on the story we just told. And so the answer is going to be the significance of the parameters beta 2 and beta 3. And if I want to be a good statistician, I should go on putting hats on all of these things because they're all estimated parameters. So if we measure the significance of beta 2, that's going to tell us how much the intercept changes, if the intercept does change in any significant way at all, because remember, that's the intercept part. And if we measure the significance of beta 3 hat, that's going to be the amount, if any significant amount, that the slope changes, because again, that's the slope part of our linear regression. And so we can see what that looks like in practice. So you can see here's an example where the intercept did definitely change. And if we look at the 95% confidence interval of the intercept, we see that it is fully outside of zero. So we can say, with confidence here, that the intercept change as a result of our treatment, but the beta 3 hat in this case did not change. That means the slope is pretty much the same as it was before. And here's another case where both of them change, where you can see the level or overall intercept of this linear regression has changed, but also the slope has clearly changed here. We're increasing our number of cones sold at a much steeper rate than we have before. And so that's the main thing I wanted to get across in this video. Um, it's not a very complicated topic. The only extension I would add here is that we've been dealing with linear models today because it's very simple. But you can really apply this technique of interrupted time series. The technique of interrupted time series is really just saying that there's some model I have in the before treatment period, and then there's some model I have in the after treatment period, and I want to see if those models are different, have different parameters in any significant way. The model can include trigonometric things like sines and cosines if you notice your data has a periodic trend. It can be a autoregressive moving average model. It can be more complicated things like a neural network model based on trees, whatever you really want. So you're pretty flexible here in terms of what you want the modeling actually to be in the before and after period. But what the technique of interrupted time series is really saying is that are the parameters, the coefficients that are in your model significantly different in the before period to the after period. And it's just that in linear regression, it's a very, very clean to tell that story because we're just looking at whether this beta two hat and beta three hat are significantly different from zero in any way. So I do hope you find a place in your work as a data scientist to give this a try. Again, the main thing I wanted to get across is that when you work as a data scientist, there's tons of reasons that you would think you can just run a test for everything, but there's many reasons you can't. Whether it's those logistical reasons, monetary reasons, ethical reasons, there's too many other tests running and we don't have space for another one. There's a whole array of reasons that you can't run a test when you would think you should be able to. And that's where awesome techniques like interrupted time series can come in. So if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Any questions are always, always welcome in the comment section below, and I'll see all you wonderful people next time.